highlights channel of the Ranveer Show. This is TRS Clips. This is just an assumption I'm making. Uh, I know that the 90s in Mumbai was heavily about the underworld and the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, it was the same. Uh, since the 2000s and we've had Shivanandan sir on the show multiple times, he's spoken about how the police force helped clean up the Mumbai underworld. Uh, I'm also assuming that was in parallel with the underworld losing its stronghold over money, over uh, power in many ways. My question to you is, was the underworld's clout, money, power ever so big that it actually made a dent in the government's work? Or no, Yes, of course it okay, did. You're absolutely right about the 1970s, 80s, even the early 90s. And the reason for that is very simple. We had an economy that was heavily dominated, ironically, by the government. So in a system where there is a dominance of government, of a small group of people, uh, where the bureaucrats, the politicians manage, gives, give out everybody licenses and so on, and then try to control the system through all kinds of rules, regulations, and intrusions, will create distortions in the market, which can be exploited to make black money. So for example, in the 70s, tax rates went above 90%. So you effectively criminalized everybody. Damn. Yes. So you banned importing of all kinds of goods. So therefore, smuggling was everywhere. Right. You gave out licenses. You said, if you want to manufacture a car, here is a license. I, and politicians would give out their licenses to their friends and family naturally. So naturally, what happened as a result is you criminalized economic activity. So that's why, you know, one of the ironies of history is that um, socialism has nothing to do with helping society. It is much more about control. And that controlled system essentially allowed for various kinds of uh, corruption. And to say that intruding in government, in many cases, the government and the criminal world begin to very quickly merge because the, gov the, the government officials, instead of having a simple set of rules that they, that they then uh, are uh, uh, enforcing, they are now a part of that uh, managing inside the system and not too much government involvement. And naturally, there is then, uh, you know, not just arrogance, but actually misuse of uh, power. And so then the, the government and criminal world will very quickly begin to merge. So that's why I keep saying that you have to be very careful not to have an, a, a, a weak and all pervasive government, which is basically what we had uh, till the 90s. Since then, we have slowly tried to reverse this. And ideally, what you want to have is a limited but strong government. Limited? Yes. A government that does a few things, but does it clearly and does it well. Mm. As opposed to an all-pervasive government that is involved in every aspect of your life, but is weak. And as a government becomes more and more all-pervasive, it will typically tend to become weaker and weaker because it's doing too many things. Spread thin. Yeah. So in your eyes, what should a government focus on? The government should focus on the following things. And by the way, this is not a new thing that we have. There are many other great economic thinkers who have made this point, going back all the way to Kautilya's Arthashastra as well, where basically what is the government there to do? The government is there for defense. It is there for internal security, monetary management, making sure the infrastructure is in good place, enforcement of uh, justice and contracts, uh, and making sure municipal systems work. It is not there to decide how business is supposed to be run. And it's certainly not there to get involved itself in business. So this whole idea of having the public sector running airlines, that was the problem. Okay. And that's why we ultimately sold off Air India back to the people who originally set up uh, Air India, which was the Tatas. Mm. So this is the point. That moment your government begins to get involved more and more into your lives, be very clear, those powers miss, will be misused by the bureaucrats, by the politicians, by the judiciary. Everybody who has excessive power will misuse it against you. And they will build links through to the uh, to people, uh, you know, with black money and criminals and other things. Because very quickly, it then becomes a one gigantic mafia. Mm. Right. Kind of like North Korea? Yes, that is where the mafia runs the whole system. Mm. You know, the way you drew out the 70s and 80s, mm. it kind of seems like you guys were growing up in a soft North Korea. Yes, it was a soft North Korea. That's precisely what it was. What do you think the emergency was? <laughs> okay. That's basically the idea. So it ultimately that system blew up because 
one of the allies of, or the driving forces of this line of approach to economic management, the USSR collapsed. And uh, e India's own economy then finally floundered and we were forced to do the uh, reforms. It's not like the political class or even the business class wanted these reforms. Yeah. It happened because our economy just couldn't go on. It just broke, broke down. Got it. Uh, okay, I'm going to give you a very rudimentary version of how I look at what happened when the mm. uh, economy opened up. Basically, the government said, hey, foreigners, you guys can now invest your money in India. You guys can set up shop in India. We used to have Campa Cola and now another cola company, which I wish to not name, uh, comes into India, sets up shop and starts selling its products here. And I'm just talking about cola, but this happened across the spectrum. Yes, so it so this is this is a very this is one very small part of it. Hmm. Before liberalization, even an Indian guy who wanted to produce a cola or a car or whatever it is couldn't do it. You had to go to the government, genuflect to the bureaucrat, the politician, etc. Then you would be given a license, and only then could you produce the car or or cola or clothes or whatever it is that you were getting a license for and of, as you can imagine if if somebody is giving you a license to produce something then you get something called a license permit raj and not surprisingly there will be all kinds of quid pro quos rent seeking etc that will happen as a result of it and because your production is not based on your efficiency your quality of your design etc but your ability to get this license therefore the dynamics of that economy which i will say will go into that direction that we discussed in the 70s and 80s mm. so Having an open system, generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, having an open system is usually a better thing. It allowed foreigners to come in. It also allowed Indian companies to grow. Okay. When yeah. is it not a good thing? Hmm? You said that it's not always a good thing. No. So there may be certain situations where, for example, uh, you may have uh, uh, um, apps from a certain neighboring country which you don't want to be used here because it's be, it, you think that those social media apps may be used to manipulate our population in a particular way. Mm. So you may ban those apps. So some control has to be there. Got it. Okay. But yeah. generally speaking, you keep the system open. Okay. Coming back to what you said earlier, you said that whatever reforms were brought about in the early 90s were applicable till about 2013, 2014 when the economy started slowing down a bit again. Because those rules and regulations were very catered to the environment and the times of the 1990s. No, so what I said is, look, we had this completely squeezed system where the government controlled everything and we opened it up, right? So one round of reforms happened and it opened up certain opportunities for investment, doing business, etc. And so it created a rush of growth, hmm. right? Because you've now opened up the door, but then that space that was created gets used up. So you now need to create a new bunch of reforms to do new things so that new bunch, round of growth can happen. And so that is the context in which says, so okay, that liberalize. So if you went back to the, seven, uh, to the 90s, liberalization and reforms meant the same thing because you basically opened it up. But by the 2000s, you began to finally realize that you needed to create regulatory bodies for these things. So along the way in the 90s and early 2000s, some regulatory bodies were created. Then along that created some more period of growth. Then you reached a stage where your infrastructure needed upgrading. So you began to infrastructure building. Then you needed a common market. So you built a common market. Each one of these reforms creates a period of growth. Hmm. Okay. But it, it'll then, you know, the, eventually the space opened up by one reform will get filled up. Right. Gotcha. And then you have to do something new to create a new, gener new dynamic of growth. So the, the act of growth is not... Uh, uh, as I said, um, as some people say, oh, it'll naturally happen. There's nothing natural about it. You have to work hard at it. Okay. And so we need to do reforms in the future as well. We have to fix our judicial system. We have to fix our bureaucracy. We have to keep doing stuff. So these are playlists made especially for you. We've tailor-made learning experiences for you. The RS Clips.